whenever you're ready, Karen. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. So it is my honor to introduce our next Ecology Center speaker, Dr. Chelsea Wood, who is an assistant professor in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences at the University of Washington. To provide a little bit of her background, Dr. Wood received her undergrad degree from Dartmouth College, which I didn't get to talk to her about today, but hopefully we'll get to at some point. Um, earned her PhD from Stanford University and did postdoctoral research at both the University of Colorado and the University of Michigan. She is also a former editor for Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. Dr. Wood's research program explores the ecology of parasites and pathogens in a changing world. In light of recent world happenings, i.e. COVID, I'm sure that her research is getting even more attention. She has published manuscripts on a wide range of taxa across the globe, but most of her work has been in marine ecosystems. Her past work investigated correlations between fishing and parasite assemblages and diversity. More recently, she's begun studying historical marine and freshwater parasitism, which I believe is what she will be talking about today. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Wood. The title of her presentation is Ghosts of Oceans Past. What can data on historical parasite burdens tell us about the future of disease? Awesome. Thank you, Karen. And uh, thank you everyone for having me. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. I was looking forward to meeting everyone in person. That was not to be, but I've had a lot of fun getting to know folks by Zoom today, hearing about mycoplasma and carnivore scat and stream macroinvertebrates, wildfire, grouse, koki frogs. And I'm looking forward to hearing about lots of other cool science tomorrow. Um, okay, so I know that everyone who is watching right now is majorly zoomed out. So I wanna make this talk as fun as possible. I'm gonna show you my vision for the future of marine disease. It's gonna involve looking to the past. And along the way, I'll show you some recently published and some unpublished data, and I'll throw in just a little bit of Spielbergian magic. So today I'm gonna to tell you about data that came from a huge field and lab effort. So I wanna make sure that you know upfront that I didn't do this all alone. Uh, this work is the results of collaborations with many folks at UCSB, as well as Scripps, Stanford, DePauw, UW, WDFW, and it wouldn't have been possible without the generous support of a number of funding agencies. One of my all-time favorite movies is Steven Spielberg's 1993 Jurassic Park, which just had its 25th anniversary. And one of the things that I love about this movie is the way that it shows what it feels like to be a scientist who studies the past. You make the inferences that you can make with the scraps of information that are left to you in the present day, but you really long to see those past ecosystems with your own eyes. Today, I'll show you my vision for the future of marine disease and how new approaches are allowing us to do what doctors Grant and Sattler did. I'll tell you the story of how I went from using the behavior of modern day birds to make inferences about the behavior of dinosaurs to actually watching dinosaurs behave in real time. Metaphorically, of course, because you guys didn't bring me here to talk about dinosaurs. What I study is far more beautiful and far more dangerous. I'm interested in marine infectious disease and the parasites that cause those diseases. And today I'll tell you the story of how I went from using the scraps of information that we can glean about the dynamics of marine infectious disease from contemporary ecosystems to literally watching parasite populations change across time. I'm gonna begin with the theoretical background that motivates my work. I'll then briefly walk you through our work in contemporary ecosystems where we're using space for time substitution to try and understand how various human impacts change the abundance of marine parasites. But I wanna spend the bulk of my time today talking to you about brand new unpublished efforts that take us from contemporary ecosystems deep into the past. And then I'll wrap up by drawing some conclusions about what marine disease of the past has to teach us about marine disease of the future. So let's begin at the beginning. I started in on this line of research because there's one question that really drives my interest in marine biology. And it is, what did the oceans look like before people? The world's oceans are being 
remade by a growing human population. If you spend time on the water, you probably have some intuition that marine ecosystems look a lot different today than they did in the past. Now that intuition isn't just nostalgia. There are hard data to suggest that the oceans have changed substantially in the past decades and that fishing is primarily to blame for this. Now, one of the easiest ways to see how fishing reshapes fish communities is to think about what a trophy fish was just a generation ago. This is a set of pictures from a 2009 paper of Lauren McClenahan's. And Lauren was really clever. She went into a public library in Key West and she found these old trophy photos taken of the same hanging board on the same wharf over the course of 60 years. These photos reflect and document the state of Key West's reefs over a long time period. And there are a couple of patterns that we can pick out in these pictures. Over time, fish become fewer, they become smaller, and their average trophic level declines. And this is just one particularly visual example, but of course it's a global phenomenon. And historical work gives us a pretty good idea of what the oceans used to look like before these impacts accumulated. We have pretty decent data for many of these large charismatic species. But as many of you are by now acutely aware, my interest in these fish goes one level deeper. Each fish here is an ecosystem in itself, and that internal ecosystem is typically concealed. But what if we could unveil it? What sorts of parasites would we see in that scene? Were there more parasites in an unfished ocean or fewer or the same overall number, but a different mix of species? Now you might think to yourself, who cares how many parasites there were before people impacted the oceans, right? They're small and unimportant. We've got much bigger things to worry about, like the loss of all of these charismatic large vertebrates. But parasites have big impacts on the rest of biodiversity. And I just want to give you one example. This guy wiggling in the upper left-hand corner is an anisacid nematode, and it's occasionally passed to people when they consume uncooked fish. I'm not going to gross you out with the symptoms, but suffice it to say, they're not fun. And the same goes for the effects of all of these parasites on their wildlife hosts. Because parasites can have strong effects on their hosts, if fishing does cause change in parasite abundance, that could end up being really important for these vertebrate animals that we care a lot about. So here we have a big unanswered question in marine biology. And one of the things that makes this question really interesting to me is that we can make really reasonable hypotheses that predict opposite outcomes. It's easy to imagine how fishing might either increase or decrease parasite abundance, depending on its effects on fish hosts. Here, I'm gonna use the same time series of day boat trophies in Key West. I'll layer on some yellow dots to represent fish parasites. And then this conceptual diagram is gonna show you what's happening in the photos. Fishing pressure is increasing as we move through time There we go, just got muted. Um, so fishing doesn't, it doesn't reduce the density of every single fish species, right? Fishermen like to catch big high trophic level species like sharks, but that's good news for the lower trophic level species that get eaten by sharks because they could experience compensatory increases in their abundance. And if that lower trophic level host is increasing in density, we might expect to see a corresponding increase in the abundance of its parasites. And in the disease ecology literature, this would be called the dilution effect hypothesis. But it's also easy to imagine how we might see the opposite pattern because hosts are both habitat and resources for parasites. Parasites could become less abundant as fishing proceeds because fishing reduces fish density or size or the trophic complexity of fish assemblages, and all of that should impact parasites. We can call this the healthy ecosystems are rich in parasites hypothesis after a tree paper by Pete Hudson, Andy Dobson, and Kevin Lafferty. But of course, when I say the word parasite, I'm invoking this sprawling group of organisms who are diverse, taxonomically, morphologically, and trophically, and there's no reason to expect them all to do the same thing. So we might also expect a mixed response to parasite abundance to fishing. And here I've changed the colors of the dots just to indicate what line they correspond to on the conceptual diagram. And then this begs one big and really important question, which is how does fishing affect whole parasite assemblages? Uh, which parasites win consistent with the dilution effect? And then are there any that lose consistent with the healthy ecosystems are rich in parasites hypothesis? And finally, is there some information that we can use to predict who is gonna fall into which camp? Years ago, 
lacking the ability to peer back in time, my team set out to answer this question using space for time substitution. And this is basically the approach where we find contemporary ecosystems that look the way that ecosystems looked in their pristine condition. And in that way, a pristine ecosystem that exists today can stand in for a pristine ecosystem of the past. We worked in the Northern Line Islands, and this is an archipelago that contains both uninhabited and unfished islands, as well as other islands that are inhabited and fished. This box is gonna go around Hawaii, about a thousand miles south of Hawaii are the Northern Line Islands. And this is a color code that I'll use throughout the talk. Blue is gonna indicate unfished islands and brown will indicate fished islands. And you can see that we've got these three fished islands in the middle and three unfished islands on either end. And the archipelago spans a gradient in abiotic factors that are correlated with latitude, as you would expect. But because we've got this mixed distribution of fished and unfished islands, we can parse those potential confounders from any fishing effects. Our fished islands are Terena, Tabuaran, and Christmas. They're part of the Republic of Kiribati. Each is inhabited by between 1,000 and 8,000 e Kiribati people, most of whom rely on subsistence fishing. And even though this is relatively light subsistence fishing pressure by a really small human population, we see really strong effects on the fish communities at these islands, very few of the top predators that are favored by fishermen. Contrast that with our unfished islands. These are Jarvis, Kingman, and Palmyra. They are part of the US Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And that designation involves strict bans on fishing that are really well enforced. And as a result of that protection, these islands are just teeming with predators. Sharks, jacks, snappers, groupers, you name it, they're out there. So these islands serve as a window into the past. This is what most coral reef ecosystems used to look like. And so these islands are a living laboratory for how coral reef ecosystems used to function. We set out to understand how fishing drives change in parasite assemblages by conducting sampling across those six islands. The sampling was done on a research cruise that was conducted in the fall of 2010, and it was run by my collaborator, Stuart Sandin, and his student, now postdoc, Brian Zaglinski, both at Scripps. They, <clears throat> they uh, sailed from Oahu all the way down the Line Islands chain, <clears throat> excuse me, and then at each of those islands, they collected fish with pole spears. And we focused on seven host species. These species were chosen to span a variety of trophic levels and body sizes so that we would maximize the taxonomic diversity that we would detect in the fish. Ultimately, we dissected 945 fish for the project across seven host species and six islands for a total of 44 parasite species, just shy of a million individual parasites. And that might sound like a lot, but it's actually a totally normal burden for fish in this part of the world. For each of those fish, we examined each organ individually for metazoan parasites. We didn't look for protozoa, viruses, or bacteria. And before we jump into the results, I want to get you oriented to one panel of what's ultimately going to be a multi-panel plot. This panel applies to Tinicatus marginatus, our bristle tooth. On the y-axis, you'll find all of the parasite taxa that we detected in this particular host species. For the parasite fanatics in the audience, these parasites are organized taxonomically so that we have the crustaceans, monogenes, trematodes, nematodes, cestodes, and acanthocephalins, and that's what those horizontal bars are meant to indicate. On the x-axis, you'll find a standardized regression coefficient for the effect of fishing. So basically, positive values on this x-axis indicate parasite taxa where we found more individuals on fished than on unfished islands, and negative values on this x-axis indicate parasite taxa where we found more individuals on unfished than on fished islands. Anything greater than positive two or less than negative two is significant, and that's why those two areas are shaded. And then all the p-values that you see on this slide and on the next slide are corrected for multiple comparisons. And so with all that in mind, we can sort of take a step back and appreciate that what this plot is showing us is that it's a whole mixed bag. We've got some parasites in this center panel that don't have a systematic response to fishing pressure. They're equally abundant on fish versus unfished islands. We have three parasites in the right-hand brown panel that are more abundant on fished islands, consistent with the predictions of the dilution effect hypothesis. And then we have three parasite taxa in the left-hand panel in blue that are actually disappearing in the presence of fishing consistent with the healthy ecosystems are rich in parasites hypothesis. And if we then zoom out and look at all seven host species, we see that that same pattern holds. It's a totally mixed bag with many parasites not responding, some responding positively, 
and some responding negatively. Now, the fact that there were such mixed responses from parasite species to parasite species is in and of itself a really interesting result. Dilution doesn't happen in the majority of cases. In fact, we often see the very opposite of dilution, parasites disappearing as fishing pressure increases. Now, these data suggest that we can't expect a homogenous response to fishing across parasites, and we could have stopped there. But we had some hypotheses about why there might be this kind of variability, and we thought that it might be related to parasite traits. So let's start peeling back the layers of this onion. We sorted our parasites into two broad types of transmission strategies, directly transmitted and trophically transmitted. Directly transmitted parasites are passed from one host to another host of the same species, but trophically transmitted parasites use multiple hosts of different species. And these are sometimes also called complex life cycle parasites. We found parasites in both of these groups. Among our directly transmitted parasites were the crustaceans and the monogenes. Among our trophically transmitted parasites, nematodes, cestodes, trematodes, and acanthocephalins. And we made some predictions based on these fundamental life history differences among the parasites. We assumed that these parasites would be transmitted in a density dependent manner so that if hosts declined in the presence of fishing, parasite transmission would decrease and parasite abundance would decrease. But we know that this is not the only thing that can happen to hosts in a fished environment. Hosts can also increase in density if, for example, fishing targets their predators and the host is released from predation. And if those hosts increase in density, it could increase parasite trans transmission and parasite abundance. So our hypothesis was that, was that directly transmitted parasites would track their hosts. In contrast, the trophically transmitted parasites are dependent on multiple host species for the completion of their life cycles. And those life cycles often include the large high trophic level species that are favored by fishermen like sharks and big predatory teleosts. And we know if you lose just one link in the life cycle of these parasites, it's game over, transmission stops. So we expected trophically transmitted parasites to be especially susceptible to the impacts of fishing on their hosts. To test these hypotheses, we basically wanted to take this analysis and turn it on its head. We wanted to group up these regression coefficients by parasite type and find out whether there were any patterns. Now remember, this is a space for time substitution, right? We wanna get some hints about what parasites would increase and which ones would decline in a fished ocean. So to answer that question, we asked whether the mean regression coefficient within a bunch of different parasite taxa differed significantly from zero. We call that the mean effect size. Um, and in this plot, we broke down the mean effect sizes within a bunch of different higher order parasite taxa, crustaceans, monogenes, trematodes, cestodes, nematodes, and acanthocephalins. Directly transmitted parasites are on the top, trophically transmitted parasites are on the bottom. The Ns that you see in parentheses are the number of taxa within each of those higher order taxonomic groups. Now, just like before, brown is gonna be a positive response to fishing and blue will be a negative response to fishing. And I'm gonna plot these mean effect sizes with 95% confidence intervals. So anything that overlaps, not significantly different. If we begin at the top, we see that the crustaceans and the monogenes each have significantly positive responses to fishing. They're more abundant on fished than on unfished islands. And there are only two groups of directly transmitted parasites. So when we combine them all up, we also get a significant positive response. Why might this be? Well, we hypothesize that the directly transmitted parasites would track their hosts. And it turns out that that's exactly what they're doing. Many of the fish species that we targeted in this study actually experienced strong increases in abundance in response to fishing pressure, probably because fishing was taking out their predators. And the parasites of those fish drive most of the positive response that you see here. So that's what's going on with the directly transmitted parasites up top. But if we move down to the tropically transmitted parasites, it's a little bit of a different story. The cestodes and the nematodes each have significant negative responses to fishing. They're more abundant on unfished than on fished islands. And we only had this one acanthocephalin, so it wasn't included in the meta-analysis, but I did want you to see that its regression coefficient was non-significantly negative. And so far, this is all consistent with our hypothesis that fishing should interrupt the life cycles of trophically transmitted parasites and cause them to decline in the presence of fishing. But the trematodes do not follow this pattern. Their response to fishing doesn't differ significantly from zero, and that's a little bit of a departure from our hypothesis and from the findings for the rest of the trophically transmitted parasites. 
We'll talk in just a second about why I think that might be. But in the meantime, if we average over all of the trophically transmitted parasites, we see that their response doesn't differ significantly from zero, but it is significantly less positive than the response of the directly transmitted parasites. Okay, so what's going on with the trematodes? I think it has something to do with their life cycles. The life cycles of the cestodes, nematodes, and acanthocephalins differ fundamentally from the life cycles of the trematodes. If you're lucky enough to begin your life as a cestode, nematode, or acanthocephalin, you're born in the gut of a large predatory vertebrate. You're pooped out into the water column, you hatch, and you go on to infect a first intermediate host crustacean like the um, copepod that's shown in this life cycle. The trematodes differ a little bit. They also use large predatory vertebrates as their final hosts, although they tend not to use elasmobranchs, they prefer teleosts. And their first intermediate hosts are benthic snails. Now, planktonic crustaceans are pretty insensitive to fishing impacts. Their abundance is determined by bottom-up forces like oceanic productivity. Fishing generally doesn't affect their abundance. So when a nematode, tapeworm, or a canthocephalin life cycle is hit by fishing, the effects are straightforward. You remove the final host, you reduce the transmission of the parasite. For the trematodes, they're also susceptible to losing that final host, but there are impacts of fishing on other parts of the life cycle. Snails are major prey of fish species. And we know from studies on Kenyan coral reefs that they can sometimes increase in abundance in fished areas where they escape their predators. So trematodes could get these counteractive effects, reductions in transmission due to fishing-driven loss of the final host, but then increases in transmission due to compensatory increases in their first intermediate hosts. And if you think about it, this actually begs a, a kind of fundamental question about parasite ecology, which is where is the rate limiting step? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do wanna give you some insight into why I offer this explanation for the equivocal response of the trematodes. And it has to do with this one weird outlier trematode Stephanostomum is a trematode larva that we actually detected in five different host species. And like I said before, trematodes usually use snails as their first intermediate host, but Stephanostomum uses a very particular type of snail, big, meaty moon snails and whelks, the snack food of the coral reef flats. Um, and these guys are especially susceptible to predation pressure. So while Stephanostomum's definitive host might be fished, it could be experiencing a strong increase in abundance of its first intermediate host, which might explain why it has such a positive response to fishing pressure. So if we consider only those trophically transmitted parasites that lack snail intermediate hosts, they do have a significant negative response to fishing pressure. And altogether, these data show that there are both winners and losers among parasites exposed to fishing pressure. In our system, the losers are the trophically transmitted parasites, especially the cestodes and the nematodes. And the winners are the directly transmitted parasites of hosts that increase with fishing and those trematodes with intermediate hosts that increase with fishing. Now, we were really excited by this finding because it suggests that the oceans might have looked a lot different in the past than they do today. Not necessarily that they've undergone an overall increase in disease or a decrease, but a shift in the kinds of parasites that are common. Now I could go on for another two hours giving you all the evidence that we've amassed to suggest that this pattern holds up in other ecosystems. And if you're interested in seeing those data, don't hesitate to raise your hand in the Q&A and I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. But suffice it to say, we've done additional studies ourselves and we've meta-analyzed the studies of other folks. And this pattern appears to be robust across many marine ecosystems. So we've got this robust pattern where we see fishing driving increases in directly transmitted parasites and declines in trophically transmitted parasites. And that's all well and good, but contemporary ecosystems are not a perfect stand-in for past ecosystems. They're kind of like this. Welcome to Jurassic Park. Wait for it. enough of that. Not the real thing. What I mean to say here is that contemporary ecosystems are a pale imitation of historical ecosystems. If we really want to know how parasite assemblages have changed over time, 
we need to find some way to get data on parasites of the past. We wanted to take the hypotheses that we had generated in our work on contemporary coral reefs and see if they could predict how parasites have actually changed over time. And so let us now pass through the gates of Jurassic Park, literally stepping back in time. People have come up with some really creative ways to glean information about historical assemblages of fishes. Some have used art like this Roman mosaic, which shows a dusky grouper, a species that's now endangered and very rare in the Mediterranean. Others have used the composition of species represented in seafood menus to learn about change in fish assemblages over time. And of course, people like to take pictures of the big fish that they catch. And creative folks like Lauren McClenahan have extracted from these photos qualitative, sometimes even quantitative data to contrast against modern fish assemblages. And these pictures are really striking, bringing home the fact that the oceans look very different today than they did even just a couple of decades ago. Parasites are just not that charismatic. No one takes pictures of them while they're on vacation. You won't find them on a menu and not many works of art are devoted to them. And so historical information on parasite assemblages is harder to come by, except for one source, museum specimens. When fish or invertebrates are dunked in ethanol or formalin, their parasites are preserved right alongside them. And we're lucky at UW to be home of the Burke Museum and its ichthyology collection, which is the largest collection of North American fishes with 11 million catalog specimens and some collections dating from the early 1900s. And that sets us up to be able to reconstruct historical parasite assemblages over a broad sweep of time. We'll return to the Burke in just a few minutes, but first let me set the scene for this next project that I wanna tell you about. My adopted hometown of Seattle is a fishing town and it has been for a long time. Today, it's the home port of the North Pacific Fishing Fleet, which ranges over thousands of miles of open ocean. But in earlier days, boats based in Seattle focused primarily on Puget Sound. Here's Puget Sound up in the US Pacific Northwest. Those white dots represent the contemporary density of human population across the landscape and Seattle's in that lower right-hand corner. Today, not a lot of ground fishing or bottom fishing happens in the US part of the sound, but for much of its history, trawling was the most important part of the Washington state fishing industry. And one of its biggest earners were English sole, which produced these lovely, mildly flavored fillets. Now you guys know that this is a parasite talk. Uh, so that means that any appetizing slide is going to be immediately followed by an unappetizing one. Around the 1930s, folks started complaining about these horrific things showing up in their delicious soul fillets. By the late 1940s, infections were bad enough that literally tons of English soul that were landed in Seattle had to be diverted to animal feed. They were too wormy for human consumption. This guy is Clavinie mammariae, a nematode parasite or blood worm, closely related to a parasite that humans get called guinea worm. Now, the brand new Washington Department of Fish and Game back in the 1940s did its thing. They commissioned a research cruise to investigate the distribution of the parasite, hoping that they would be able to find a part of Puget Sound that could still be profitably exploited. The RV Panther went out in 1949 and 1951, and those guys collected reams and reams of data on the abundance of this parasite in English Seoul. But they failed. There was no part of the southern region of Puget Sound that was free of the parasite. Their data got filed into a cardboard box and dumped into the basement of WDFW headquarters in Olympia. And when I first started at UW four or five years ago, I got a call about this original data set from a WDFW scientist who was rooting around in that basement. I had been searching for years for good historical data documenting marine parasite abundance for any parasite in any ocean at any historical time point. These data are exceedingly rare. And so this data set fell into my lap like a gift from God. Another gift from God arrived shortly after, Ingrid Howard, an amazing undergraduate um, who uh, did all of this work as part of her undergraduate capstone thesis. If you wanna read more of the details of Ingrid's work, you can check it out in a, a recently published paper in the Journal of Applied Ecology. Okay, so we began just by looking at the historical data that were available. We entered all of the data from the WDFW commissioned Panther Cruises in 1949 and 1951. And because this is an economically important parasite, we were also able to gather some data from literature resources as well. 
We then recreated all of these historical sampling efforts in 2017. We sampled the same locations using the same gear at the same depths. On the x-axis, I'll show you five locations where we were able to match our contemporary collections to historical data. And on the y-axis, you'll find the prevalence of the parasite Clavinema maria. For every site, historical prevalence was lower than contemporary prevalence. And on average, prevalence was about 50% lower in the past than it was in the present. That's really interesting, right? This is uh, a fascinating result, but this parasite is one of those rare economically important parasites where we actually do have historical data. I'm curious about all of the parasites, not just the handful that we happen to have data for. So we wanted to see whether we would get the same story if we looked to the museum specimens. And this would serve a couple of purposes. First, it would let us confirm this super interesting pattern because we'd be testing for a temporal pattern with two completely orthogonal data sets. And if we got the same story, it would bode well for all of those other parasites where we have no historical data to use for ground truthing. Um, this is kind of like a proof of concept, right? Testing whether you get the same answer from looking to the museum specimens that you do when you actually go out and measure the parasite in nature. Because after all, the, the museum specimens could be a biased subsample of the full population. But if the historical data and the museum specimens tell the same story, that means that they might be a reliable way to reconstruct parasite assemblages of the past. And we might be able to use museum specimens to reconstruct change over time for those parasites where there is no historical record, which is to say almost all the parasites. So Ingrid set out into the UW ichthyology collection. Oh, sorry. Um, and she pulled every single English soul that was in the collection. Uh, she counted the number of Claveny mammariae in each one of these fish. And here's what her data looked like. Each fish had on average 0.1 worms at the beginning of the data set and 0.8 worms at the end of the data set, a eightfold increase in burden over that time period. So we get the same story, whether we look at the historical record or the museum specimens, and it's a story of increasing parasite abundance through time. But of course, it's the story of only one parasite species in one host species. And we wanna be able to tell a much grander tale across many parasite species. So I launched a new project that my lab likes to call Parasites of the Past. The project is supported by the UW Innovation Imperative and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And it's being carried out in collaboration with Luke Tornabene, who is the curator of fishes at the UW Fish Collection and Catherine Mazlenikov, its collections manager. We're expanding to look at all the parasites in museum specimens of 10 Puget Sound fish species. And these species were again, chosen to span a variety of trophic levels and body sizes so that we would maximize the diversity of parasites that we would find in them. Most of them are available at the UW Fish Collection, although we're gonna be supplementing from other museums as well. And we should be able to get back into the 1880s for many of these species. So, you know, in the first part of this project, we just looked at English sole. We saw that this one parasite exploded in abundance. And we wanted to know, would that be the story for all of the parasites in this data set? I can't answer that question for you yet, but I do want to tell you about some of our preliminary data. We wanted to know, do the predictions that we generated in our work on contemporary coral reefs jive with how parasite assemblages have actually changed through time? And the idea here is to look at trajectories of parasite change across a century long time scale. But first we needed to answer a really pressing question, which is, are museum specimens even reliable? Can we count on them for accurate information about how many parasites were in a fish at the time of its death? Ingrid studies showed us that we get the same direction and magnitude of change over time, whether we look at the museum specimens or the historical data, but it still might be possible that it's just tougher to find parasites in a fixed fish specimen. And so museum specimens could consistently underestimate the true abundance of parasites for any given fish. Now museum uh, museums preserve their fish by first fixing them in formalin and then they store them in ethanol. And if that changes the detectability of parasites, it could bias our estimates of their abundance. So to address this question, we ran a simple experiment. And when I say we, I mean my master's student, Evan Fiorenza. Evan got a hold of a bunch of fish and he randomly assigned them to either be preserved with the museum's preservation protocol or they were put into a control group where he didn't do anything to them. 
then he performed parasitological dissections on all these fish and we compared the differences between the treatments. And what Evan found was that there was a minimal influence of preservation on parasite detectability. He found 27 parasite species and of these, only three differed between the control and preservation treatments and those three differed in opposite directions. Some were more detectable in control and some were more detectable in preservation. Evan aggregated the response to preservation across all of those 27 parasite species he found. And what he discovered was that no group was easier to detect in one treatment versus the other. Values to the right of this axis indicate parasites that were easier to detect in the preservation treatment and on the left, easier to detect in the control treatment. There's no difference between the treatments when you look across all the parasites in gray, uh, when you compare larvae versus adults in blue, or when you compare the various um, higher taxonomic groupings of parasites in rainbow at the bottom. Okay, so between Ingrid's study and Evan's study, we can now be pretty confident that the museum specimens are providing us with reliable information on parasite abundance. And with that in mind, we set out to answer our core research question, which is how has parasite abundance changed over the past century? We've assembled a crack team to address that question. Rachel Wellicky, Whitney Presser, Katie Leslie, and Natalie Mastic. The work that I'm about to show you has been led by Rachel, and she's the first author on the resulting publication, which should be appearing in Frontiers in Ecology in the Environment in the next couple of months. Now, these guys are dissecting our uh, 10 selected host species, and these are literal parasite time capsules passed down to us from decades ago. We're just finishing the very first year of this project, and we've finished dissecting four host species. Um, and we finished the data cleaning for only one host species, the one that's shown here, English sole. Now, the data cleaning and the dissections take some time because we're confirming all of our taxonomic IDs with Mike Kinsella, who is retired but is graciously working with us. Um, so we don't have all the data from this project yet, but I do want to show you our results for this very first host species of the project. So I'll begin by getting you oriented to one panel of what will ultimately be a multi-panel plot. What I'm gonna show you are a bunch of time series spanning from about 1930 to 2016. On the x-axis will be year and on the y, parasite abundance. And these are gonna be partial residuals that are adjusted for differences in fish body size over time. We um, do our best to make sure that we're keeping the body size that we're sampling consistent across time, but we also adjust for this in all of our statistical models just to make extra sure. I'll throw a regression line through each cloud of points with an associated 95% confidence interval. And then each plot that I show you is gonna represent one parasite species of uh, one of these groups that'll be indicated with cartoons. We've got copepods and leeches among our directly transmitted parasites and trematodes, nematodes, cestodes, and acanthocephalins among our trophically transmitted parasites. I've grouped up all of these parasites by their responses. So I'll show those to you slide by slide. In total, we detected 12 parasite taxa in this one host species, English sole. Of those 12, nine did not change in their abundance through time. So that's across the 85 years of this data set. Among these nine, I want you to notice that there are a couple of directly transmitted parasites here, leeches and copepods. There are also a number of trophically transmitted parasites. And those arrow bands can make it look like some change has happened over time, but none of the changes that you see here are significant. However, we did have one out of our 12 species that increased in abundance through time. This is a trematode larva called a metacercaria that we detected far more of in recent years than we did in the deep past. And then we also had two species that actually declined through time. And here we have one acanthocephalin and one trematode, both trophically transmitted parasites. Um, so those are our results at the individual level. We have 12 parasite species overall, nine don't change, one increases, two decrease through time. But those are just the results at the individual level, right? And we're really more interested in making predictions um, based on parasite traits or their membership in these higher order uh, taxonomic groups. So what if we harnessed replication across those parasite species and asked about trends within those groups? Here are results summarized across parasite groups positive values on this x-axis indicate parasite taxa that have increased through time. Negative values on the x-axis indicate parasite taxa that have declined through time. Neither trophically transmitted parasites nor directly transmitted parasites have a consistent direction of change in their aggregate. Here, complex is used in place of trophically transmitted. The one place where we did see a significant effect was among the acanthocephala, a group of trophically transmitted parasites, which declined through time. 
So this doesn't strictly match our prediction that directly transmitted parasites would, would increase over time while trophically transmitted parasites would decline. But we do have a lot of change happening. So I don't know, they're sort of moving in herds. I'm not nearly as prescient as Alan Grant. And we have a lot more work to do on this project, a bunch more host species coming up. And perhaps it's the case that these patterns will get clearer as we increase our replication at the level of parasite taxa. But our next step for these English sole parasites is to identify the factors associated with changes in parasite burden through time. Because fishing isn't the only thing that's changing in this ecosystem. Maybe the changes that we've observed in the parasites of Puget Sound are driven by the steady incremental increase in temperature that we've seen in the sound over that time period, which could speed up parasite life cycles. Or maybe it's driven by the change in nutrient pollution, um, which comes due to development, agriculture, and logging, because that could facilitate blooms of the intermediate host copepods that a lot of these parasites need to complete their life cycles. Or maybe it's due to just the ebb and flow of host density through time, because it's not the case that Puget Sound has just been increasingly exploited through time. In fact, um, through environmental regulation and fisheries regulations, the amount of pressure on fish in Puget Sound has actually considerably slackened since the mid part of the uh, 20th century. So any of these explanations are plausible, but, but which ones actually correlate with change over time and parasite burdens? Well, we're lucky in this ecosystem because there are you know, these various major drivers that are pretty independent of one another. And also because Puget Sound is a well-studied region where we've got some decent historical data. There's a continuous record of sea surface temperature from 1921 to the present day from Race Rocks Lighthouse in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. There's a great study documenting biomarkers of nutrient pollution in sediment cores, which covers the period of 1880 to 2000. And then finally, there are historical fisheries data documenting the relative density of most of the hosts that we're interested in. And again, we're super lucky because I'm working right down the hall from a lot of the people who are reconstructing these historical fisheries data. We're working with Tim Essington in my department at UW, as well as Jamil Samhori and Corey Green at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center to chase this down. And in the next few years, we hope to have some hints about the forces that are correlated with parasite increase or parasite decline through time. So while I can't answer this why question for you now, rest assured we're, we're getting closer both to describing the patterns of parasite change through time and to figuring out what are the drivers of those changes. The past is past. We stand at this moment of unprecedented change for Earth's ecosystems. So what does all of this mean for the future of marine disease? What's gonna go on under the surface of the visible world among all these hidden parasites that, that typically remain unseen? Are we in for an explosion of marine disease or will future oceans see the loss of parasite species, even those that contribute to ecosystem function? I can't say with a ton of certainty at this point, which are the parasite taxa that are likely to increase and which are the ones that are likely to decline. But I do know that we are gonna see both of those things as we move into the future. We're gonna lose some parasite species and gain others. And both of those outcomes have important implications for our ability to feed the world with seafood and to rely on functioning coastal zones for ecosystem services. And that's because the losers probably include a lot of parasites with important roles to play. That might sound counterintuitive because we usually think of parasites as bad. And by definition, yes, they're bad for their hosts, but they can sometimes be good for ecosystems. Um, they're natural parts of ecosystems. They perform vital ecosystem functions. And that's especially true for the trophically transmitted parasites. We can talk more about this later, but to keep it brief, they might keep host populations in check they might lubricate vital predator-prey interactions. They might actually be responsible for subsidizing apex predators. And losing these parasites could mean losing the ecosystem services that they provide. Meanwhile, the winners uh, probably include a number of parasites that we don't want around, pests of aquaculture and wildlife, and potentially pests of people. We've learned a lot from studying marine disease in contemporary ecosystems. But now that we have a way to get into Jurassic Park, I am not hopping on a helicopter and leaving. We have an opportunity here to resurrect long dead information, information that most people thought was gone forever. And this information could help prepare us for a changing world. Thank you.